Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Oh, I love it. OK. So oops, and I am already messing up the presentation. Great. I'm going to step to the side here. So hi, I'm Dr. Megan Davis, for those of you who don't know me. And on behalf of the entire research committee, I am delighted to welcome you to our Grand Round series for 2018-19 in the Department of Environmental Health and Engineering. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment just to acknowledge our colleagues and neighbors to the south and hope for their safety and health getting through Hurricane Florence. This first Grand Rounds is jointly sponsored by Lunch Learn Link Group, and there's going to be pizza and salad following the lecture today. So be sure you pick up one of these tickets. If you don't have one yet, you can get one on the way out, but we're going to try to circulate them around. The food is going to be at the Wall of Wonder. And for those of you who are not familiar with this building, you go out this door, you turn right, go down, and you can't miss it. It is a wall of wonder wonder. So the Grand Round series is really in the tradition of bringing a lot of innovation and different perspectives into our department from outside of our department. And we're going to be starting a new tradition of trying to bring back some of our uh, LUM who have gone off in new directions so that they can reinvigorate our thinking with what they've learned. In that spirit, the next Grand Rounds will be on October 12th, and we will have Dr. Amir Sapkota, who's is going to talk about climate change and impaired health, highlighting the need for community-specific adaptation strategies, kind of appropriate given the weather today. So Dr. Fana Sile is going to announce our current speaker for today, and thank you for your time. Hello. Um, I'm Fena Soye, and I will be introducing Dr. Mohamed Hoke, who is um, an as associate professor in the uh, School of Medicine at the Department of Otolaryngology, and he also has an uh, appointment in the Department of Oncology, as well as the Department of Urology. And um, as those associations imply, uh, a lot of his work is um, involved around um, bladder cancer, but also head and neck cancers and lung cancers. And what is relevant for us today is that he has also studied um, the effect of arsenic on bladder cancer and specifically stemness. So Dr. Um, Hoke has um, had done, um, his education and uh, received this education in mostly um, uh, in the undergraduate uh, and um, baccalaureate at, uh, in Bangladesh and then he did his um, PhD in Japan and at the um, uh, um, and he was a, a, a Fuji Odusoka research fellow there at the Tokushima University. And then he became a postdoctoral fellow at Johns Hopkins University. And in 2007, he became an assistant professor in um, all, the, all three departments. And um, most recently, uh, in 2012, he became an associate professor. So interesting facts is that um, he received m many honors and awards, of which a career development award, but also a faculty grant award from the Global uh, Center for Global Health here at Hopkins and the JSPS U US Alumni Association Seminar Program 2017 award. Um, he has also inventions, several pending, but the one that he got awarded was for the ovarian cancer metalome. And um, today, I, um, he was funded um, by many uh, uh, grants, and uh, interestingly, also won by the Flight Attendant and um, Cancer Research um, Institute, and uh, mostly by the NCI. And today, Dr. Um, Hoke will present his work on um, arsenic and um, cancer stemness. Thank you, Pena, for your kind introduction and all the description to, or, I mean, to collect it through my CV. And thank you, Megan, for giving us brief uh, overall thought of this grand round. So I'm going to start right away. So basically, as Fena told, uh, Thank you. 
so I am going to talk about sorry. Yes, thank you. So my main research focus is cancer epigenetics, but today I am not going to talk about the cancer epigenetics. I am going to talk about the arsenic and cellular stimness. So the objective mainly is characteriz characterization, I mean brief information of arsenic as a health hazard. Then the model, we prepare in vitro model for last several years and characterize that model. And I will also show how we can eradicate cancer stem cell and how that enhance systemic therapy. And only one slide or one example I will show the challenges of eradicating cancer stem cell and it is mainly due to the cancer stem cell heterogeneity. And I will show some marker, stem cell marker that can be used as a marker of exposure or as a marker of early cancer detection, I mean in a non-invasive way. So to tell like little evidence we know, there is no, almost no evidence about genetic situation or genetic mechanism and developing bladder cancer. Mostly it is considered with environmental and then some genetic component come for changing it. But environmental factor is one of the main factor for developing bladder cancer. And basically among lot of environmental factors, this is arsenic and it was previously thought two microgram per liter, if it is in the water, it is high risk group. And but now, when more data is accumulating, WHO guideline is 10 microgram per liter. If it is above that, it is a health hazard. And it is not only associated with cancer, I mean mostly like bladder cancer, lung cancer, and head and neck cancer, but it is associated with a lot of other disease condition like cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, etc. So now basically worldwide geographic area, so if you see this map and you see almost all of the world, there are some reason where arsenic concentration is high. And in United States, you see there are some like above 50, if you see this sign, you will see there are a lot of area throughout the map that is high arsenic condition. And the main problem is not only in water, because there is a FDA alert few years back, in apple juice, there was arsenic, and the concern was what number low we are going to low? Because if low uh, level of arsenic, but it is long time exposure, then definitely it may be health hazard. Then not only in apple juice, there are other evidence shows that in this poultry, that may also increase the, uh, I mean, it contain arsenic and it may cause health hazard. So this is the, I took from the Google, actually it is from as Hannah told, like I am from Bangladesh. So you see, this is original picture. That is people who exposed to high level of arsenic and this is the external situation. And you can imagine what happens for majority of the people in the internally, where you cannot see visually. So now, Probably as it is an environmental department, so this, you guys all are familiar with um, this figure. So here like endogenous stimuli or some environmental factors and genetic and epigenetic factors. So basically for, if there is genetic or some single nucleotide polymorphism, it is in genetic level or in the epigenetic level, 
there is epigenetic or genetic susceptibility, and there is some somatic alteration as well, and there is interaction with the environmental factors, uh, the internal or external, then there should be aberrant ex gene expression. And basically, today I am going to tell about you the something in this situation to in this situation. Basically, there are some cell, we called it tumor initiating cell or cancer stem cell, that are responsible for initiation, progression, and therapeutic resistance. What I am going to show, I mean, more details in this review article. So what you see in carcinogenesis, and there is dysregulated factors internally, and there may be some genetic and epigenetic here, it's listed, the review are like somatic mutation or somatic uh, changes. But I mean, there should be some somatic epigenetic changes also occur, and that lead to cancer stem cell. And this cancer stem cell, if it is oil differentiated, we can treat it very easily and it can be rejected by our immune system or if you give chemotherapy or radiotherapy, easy to kill. But there are some cells we cannot kill and they are the problematic. So, and if you are able to eradicate this cell, probably we are able to prevent or if cancer develops, we are able to treat appropriately. I mean, there should not be any recurrency, or we can increase the longevity of the patient if somebody suffers from metastatic disease. But the problem is, in this population also, there is heterogeneous um, stem cell. What I am not going to talk more today, but probably later sometimes, so that's actually work going, ongoing. And the stem cell, from person to person, it's also very cancer stem cell when from tumor to tumor, intra and inter, both is different. So now people are trying in a different way to target cancer stem cell, hoping that, I mean, if we able to target or if we able to eradicate cancer stem cell, probably we will able to enhance chemotherapy or immunotherapy, but still no success and the area I am working on in the pathway. So if we block those pathways with chemotherapy, probably we can treat bladder cancer more effectively. So a couple of years back, we started working on this, and basically as arsenic, I mean, species to species is very uh, response to arsenic, so animal is not a good model to study. So we basically use normal immortalized human urothelial cell. We treated it with uh, three carcinogen, uh, cigarette smoke, nicotine, and arsenic. So basically we have details data of cigarette smoke and arsenic, but we have the model for nicotine. Then I will show about the arsenic. So basically, for cigarette smoke and arsenic, we try to develop tumor in the mice, in nudie mice, but it does not develop. But there are a lot of changes. And this is the control. So basically, these are the paper over the last few years uh, we published. So what you see here, I mean, here is the cigarette smoke model. And basically, we studied some genetic and epigenetic using this model and validated that in human smoker and non-smoker. What I am not going to show much. And here also is uh, in arsenic model, we have seen EMT, which is some sort of like one of the stem cell associated factor, epithelial mesenchymal chemical transition. Then we also see epigenetic alteration and microRNA, which is details in this paper I am not going to show. And here I am going to show you how arsenic exposure lead to malignant stemness. So briefly you see when you treated arsenic, then cell get growth advantage over the time. Then this is wound healing assay. You see, I mean, over the time, the wound healing is more if long time treatment. And this is the invasion assay. And after arsenic treatment, 
it is more invasive and even if we withdraw, we really did not see any differences. Withdraw means like we treat like 12 month, then 2.5 month, we culture the cell without any treatment, without any arsenic, normal medium, but it does not reverse significantly. And this is one of the fundamental factor of spare formation for cancer stem cell. So you see here, I mean, SPR increases, I mean, when, I mean, treated than untreated. And when the time is more, you see more SPR. And this is two cell line. This cell line are developed from patient who are exposed to arsenic, I mean, basically in Taiwan. So you see in this cell line as well, you see more SPR which is more than even 12 month toxinic exposure in vitro what we did. Then here an, another factor is like a self renewal. So from passes two to passes three, you see in passes three, the SPR is more. So it means cell gain some stimness properties. Then we tested some candidate stem cell marker. You see in most of the cases in arsenic SPR and arsenic treated ferentral, you see this stem cell marker expression are high. And we did by Western here, you can see this stem cell, key stem cell marker and factor, the increases by the treatment. And these are the EMT marker, you can see here, ecadirine losses and ancadirine and by maintaining increases, snail, snail increase, increases, that means that EMT process is going on. Then you can, you can see is redifferentiation. That is another characteristic of cellular stimness or cancer stimness. You see here differentiation marker increase when we culture the cell, I mean in this cell compared to SPR. And stem cell marker decrease. Then Therapeutic resistance, another criteria, cancer stem cell are more resistant to therapy. So you see in chemotherapy, they are uh, resi more resistant than other cell population. And this is the spheroid cells invasion assay. You can see here, when we treated with arsenic spare and unexposed uh, 12 month cell in arsenic spare, the invasion is more. So another characteristic of cancer stem cell, it is already reported that it should be basal type. So using our array data, we did the analysis. You see basal type is prominent, the basal gene expression, and we confirm it by RT-PCR. So in summary, what we found in this model, like these are all the criteria, then we can say that by arsenic treatment, this model gain cancer stem cell properties. So now we want to see what pathway really altered. So we did comprehensive micro, I mean bioinformatic analysis. So actually we did two array. This is stem cell array data, who does not, which contain near 100 gene. So you see SOX2 is the top. And this is Illumina expression array data. And you see here, basically, these are the three pathway, EGFR, then COX-2, and EF1 pathway, they are enriched. So I am not going to talk about this EGFR today. I am going to talk about EF1, COX-2, and SOX-2 uh, to see what this molecule does in human and how we can target those molecule. So to see the human relevance, what you see here, SOX2 is expressing like it is a marker of exposure. I mean, arsenic exposed and the exposed and non-exposed, you can see in exposed, SOX2 expressing more and in no cancer and cancer also in cancer it is more. In SOX2, exposure and non-exposure not significant, but with cancer it is significant. I mean SOX2 expression. Then 
uh, it is although not very strong, but this expression SOX2 and COX2 expression are correlated. Then we, we did ROC, you see here, like sensitivity about 75 here, and in arsenic exposed and non-exposed, that is, you can use this probably as a marker of exposure, but this is very preliminary study, so we cannot make any conclusive comments, but this is the case. And here, cancer and non-cancer, that is also the sensitivity is very reasonable, with reasonable specificity. So, but the most important thing is, in, I mean, clinic, in the clinic, the problem is like cytology negative, only 40% low grade tumor we able to detect by cytology. Then the rest we cannot. But here you can see we able to, this two marker, able to take 75%. I mean, we have only few, 16 cases, where the cytopathology is still negative, but eventually it was diagnosed as positive by pathology. So then the sensitivity is 75% and low grade also it able to take and specifically non-invasive, I mean non-muscle invasive tumor, it is 85% sensitivity with specificities about 71.3. So for a screening study, definitely we all know we need a sensitive marker that will not miss. Then we can do confirmatory study whether that particular person do have cancer or not. So basically, what I am trying to tell it, if we extend this study, probably there is a chance, there is potential. Uh, this marker can be used clinically. Now, the targeting cancer stem cell, people are trying, as I mentioned before, so, but the strategy we need to develop that Will, that has less side effect, but it will enhance the chemotherapy or immunotherapy, and in other words, systemic therapy. So these are the actually in this three paper, we describe very clearly in this paper, we have shown how EAP1 and COX2 combined inhibition enhance chemotherapeutic sensitivity that I will partially show some data. And this is, we reviewed and we include some of our findings that how uh, EAP1 is associated with immune suppression. And this is in lung adenocarcinoma. That is basically, I told you that I will tell something about heterogeneity because this inhibition was not work in bladder cancer, but what we found very nice data in lung adenocarcinoma using the same molecules. So this is the question of probably cancer to cancer it varies. So this is actually almost my conclusive slide, but I bring it up, the reason is for easy explanation. Now my goal is to block COX-2 and EAP-1 because these two molecules regulate SOX-2, which is the master stem cell factor, and which is mostly by our data showing in urothelial cancer, it regulates cancer stem cell. But unfortunately, it is a undragable target. The reason is due to the protein structure. It cannot be targeted. People tried long time, uh, it had no success. So then something above it, if we able to inhibit, so probably we will able to eradicate expansion of cancer stem cell. And what I am not going to show, we show the mechanism in the paper, it is detailed, how SOX2 mechanistically regulate, uh, how COX-2 mechanistically regulate SOX-2, and how EAP-1 um, regulate SOX-2, and how, what is the role of SARC here. But I am not going to show those data today. So first come role of SOX-2 in urothelial CSC generation and maintenance. So we knock down SOX2 here. 
So when we knock down, you can see the SPR here. The SPR permission decrease, as I told before, like SPR permission is one of the characteristic of cancer stem cell. And this is just the image. And here you can see when we overexpress SOX2 in 20, T24 cell, which does not express SOX2 endogenously, then you see SPR formation increase. We saw it multiple cell lines, but I showed only one cell line from both sides. So then in vivo, what you see here, like this is OET and also like when you inhibit SOX2, tumor OET decreases. And this is tumor volume. I mean, in SOX2 says this clone, all this clone, tumor growth slow down in comparison with the controls. And the most important thing of cancer stem cell is limited dilution assay. So what you see, when we implant 100 cell, 100 assay cell, basically I mean, when we block SOX2 here, you can see in control, seven out of eight tumor develop. And here, it is decreased significantly. So that means SOX2 is the key factor for stimness. And limited dilution assay is widely used to, under, to study the in vivo study of cancer stem cell. Then what is the consequence of overexpression? You will see basically the opposite direction as I show you previous slide. And in the limiting dilution, you see here zero. When you overexpress, even with 100 cell, four out of eight develop tumor and five out of eight develop tumor in another clone. I mean, when you overexpress SOX2. So that means in both side, it says SOX2 is doing something and generating cancer stem cell. So this is the Western blot in both sides in the spheroid. So basically, these are the stem cell marker or end factors. So you see, I mean, due to knockdown of SOX2, these factors are decreases. And due to overexpression of SOX2, these factors are increases generally. So now we talk about this one. Now we'll see how COX2 regulates SOX2. So briefly what we see here, so we saw here you see the genetic blockage of SOX2. So when we did genetic blockage of SOX2, so number of SPR you can see here basically decreases. And PGE2, it is a metabolite of COX, I mean, after COX2, it's come, basically prostaglandin E2. Then when you add it prostaglandin E2, then it's regained. And this is the image anyway. And here, pharmacologic. So just uh, this I am coming later. But here you can see when you add celoximib. And celoximib is a COX2 inhibitor and widely clinically used for pain and some other condition. So what you see here, like when we block COX2, then you can decrease the uh, SPR. That is, I mean, stem cell property going down. That's true for several other cell lines as well. Then when you rescue SOX2, say COX2 is knocked down, how SOX2 is the main factor, that's I'm telling to, um, I mean, telling in this slide. So when you rescue SOX2 in COX2 knockdown, you see it is regained. I mean, in this figure, and these are the additional cells, and this is BFTC905 cells. Remember, this cell line, BFTC905 and 909, they are developed from the arsenic exposed population. Now we are going to say how EF regulate SOX2. So basically, 
here you can see f1 over expression nncsc trade as determined by spr formation you can see in three different clone we see it it over express spr and here in vivo you can see like when we over express EAP1, you can see the growth advantage. That is EAP1 work as an oncogene. So then effect of SOX2 knockdown, the similar things in EAP1 over express cell. So you, you see here, the SPR come down. I mean, when we knock down SOX2, so basically, the conclusion is SOX2 is the key factor. And you see here in BFTC905 cell, here you see in SOX2 over EAP1 over express, then SOX2 knockdown, tumor growth inhibited. So now this data I did not bring. Mechanistically, we have found that EF and COX-2 signaling pathway accelerate CSC trade. And in a steady state condition, they are fine. They regulate SOX-2. But inhibition of either pathway has effect on another pathway. So basically, that's why, I mean, mechanistically, we found the data like one pathway blockade is not enough to see the tumor growth inhibition. So ultimately, both pathways need to be inhibited. And that actually, before that, I mean, before testing it in uh, genograft and cell line, I mean, uh, patient-derived genograft model and cell line genograft model, we have seen what happens in human tissue. So what here, this is RNA expression, and you see here SOX2, COX2, and EAP1 expression. And EAP1 is not that significant in non-cancer and cancer. The reason is, because later we figure out that EAP1 also express in some immune cell. So if it is, a, we, we did not do laser capsule microdissection, so the reason of not significant is it is active in cancer cell definitely, but in non-cancer tissue as well, you will see some other blood cell that is also expressed EAP1. That's why you are not seeing differences here, but you can see differences for SOX2 and COX2 in non-cancer and cancer cases. And they are, although not very strong, but some are strong, they are correlated. This is RNA label. Then we did 583 human sample. We tested by immunohistochemistry just by seeing which cell is expressing. And you see here, like it is correlated. Like EAP1, SOX2, SOX2, COX2, EAP1, COX2. That is there is correlation between expression of this. Then based on this data, I mean, we did some survival uh, analysis. You can see here, like if low, their survival is better than if it is high. And here is also the same case at the combination. And SOX2, it is not significant, and there is explanation for that, definitely. So now we want to see dual, because before going to the pharmacologic inhibition, because all as we know that all the pharmacological agent may have non-specific effect. So we want to see first genetic inhibition. If we do dual genetic inhibition, what happens? So that's why. I mean, we try to inhibit both EAP1 and COX2. So what we did in EAP1 knockdown cell, we added COX2 siRNA. So here, here, you see, I'll a little bit. Anyway, so this is the both inhibition. 
So when both inhibition, you can see SOX2 expression decrease dramatically. And when we did a spare formation assay, we are getting consistent result because a spare formation will be decreased, what you see here. Like when we added siRNA of COX2 in a upon knockdown cell, we are getting less spare. That is, stimulus property is decreasing. Then we did in vivo study. So that is, in the previous slide, we show in vitro, then we see what happens in vivo. So what you see here, basically this and this, when we added both, like seloximab by creating in EF1 knockdown, then we added seloximab. So when you use seloximab, the growth is inhibited significantly than single inhibition. And this, the same case for this clone as well in comparison with the control. And it is, here you see when we add EAP1 knockdown, then we added seloximab, that is COX2 inhibitor, you are seeing the same things. So now the question is whether we can use pharmacological agent to see the effect if we block COX-2 and EAP-1, whether we can inhibit tumor growth. And fortunately, this both are FDA approved, this reagent, bartiforfin and celecoxib. Celecoxib is for the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory disease, and bartiforfin is for macular degeneration. It is clinically used and system, I mean, um, bartiporin is given systemically, so probably if when we will go to the clinical trial, we need not any phase one study because it is the safety issue already been solved. So, but there are some disadvantages for both of them, as you know, but that is solvable. So what we saw here, because this slide I showed you before as well, here I want to point out seloximib plus bartipurin, that is COX-2 inhibitor plus EAP-1 inhibitor, you see the spare formation dramatically decrease here. And it is true for varieties of bladder cancer cell line in, the, in, in, in vitro. So basically what I am trying to tell here is in vitro it shows is effective and we have also tested the pharmacodynamics and it is effective. It is inhibiting the EAP1 and COX2. Then we have shows in a genograph model what happens. So this is seloximab plus bartiporin, we grow the tumor in mice and start treating them and we see growth inhibition here. But here you can see when SOX2 is active there, we really cannot inhibit very much. So that is the SOX2 is the key. Then the issue is we understand by seeing this graph in the previous slide, really we cannot eradicate, we cannot regress tumor. We can slow down, but we cannot regress. So that's why the goal is we need probably some systemic therapy, like chemotherapy. So we try to test it, what happens if we add chemotherapy with this two inhibitors. So what you see here, first we treat with CDDP, I mean um, cisplatin drug. Then we again treat it with seloximib plus bartiforin and it significantly reduced the spare formation. And this is in other cell line. And you see 
CDDP TV, Seloximab CDDP, Bartiporin CDDP, Seloximab plus Bartiporin. That is all the three combination of these two that is EAP1 inhibitor and COX2 inhibitor plus chemotherapy is more effective. Then we want to see this in cell line genograph. So the point here is, like you see here, it really regressed the tumor. It's coming back, but that's probably the mechanism need to be studied further. But it really does, like it regressed tumor than any other arms. And here is the pharmacodynamics. You can see COX-2 and EAP-1 in the tumor decreases. Then here you can see because celoximib there is a trial because it increases the cardiovascular diseases. So we want to see whether any other inhibitor of COX-2 or of that pathway is effective or not. So we use EP4 and we see the similar results. So that means the goal is if we block COX-2 and EAP-1 then we treat the patient with chemotherapy, we really can regress the tumor. So then the question is, in cell line, anything can happen. That over the last several decades, actually, decades, people know that. So then we want to see most human relevant, most relevant model. So here we use FDX model, that is patient-derived genograph model. I mean, those of you who are a student, patient-derived genograph means like we took the tumor directly from the patient, then we grow it in the mice, same tumor, so it contrain the same stroma of the human. And it has been shown by different study, till five to 10 passes, this model maintain the same genetic and epigenetic um, I mean, phenomenon as primary human cancer. So here you see, we are seeing the same result. It really regressed the tumor when we added three. But when we added, like only on, in comparison with other arm, basically. So we need to, the rationale here is we need to as mechanistically one pathway compensate another pathway. So we need to block both, both pathway in addition to uh, chemotherapy to kill the bulk tumor cell. Because probably this inhibition like bartiforfin and celecoxib cannot kill the bulk tumor cell. They only inhibit the cancer stem cell generation but to kill the bulk tumor cell, you need some systemic therapy, either immunotherapy or chemotherapy. And the, we know that for bladder cancer, uh, recently they approved immunotherapy, but the response rate is somewhere 20 plus minus. So what will happen to remaining as 80% patient? So you need some addition with immunotherapy as well. So to be in conclusion, for this targeted therapy study, I did not show you this data. We have this data. Actually, my colleague who working here, he's here. I mean, we have very promising data because when we overexpress EAP1, we see TRAG and MDSC go up, different population. And when we inhibit, we see the opposite. And this study is ongoing. Probably, if we use checkpoint inhibitor plus some stem cell pathway inhibitor, we can enhance immunotherapic efficacy as well. But more or less, after long trial in FDX model free clinical trial, we have the hope that bartiporin plus celoximab or any other COX-2 inhibitor and 
chemotherapy may go for clinical trial. Now, this is just a single slide from this publication um, I bring. We recently just published this. So this is in the FDX model. So basically, it is GLI pathway inhibitor. What we tried with CDDP in bladder cancer, it does not work. But here, it does, seems. So that means, definitely, it is, it is in lung adenocarcinoma. There is a differences there. I mean, one shoot is not possible for all cancer. Even one shoot in the same cancer for different patient, it should be different. So we are now studying that. That is the, I mean, cancer stem cell heterogeneity issue. Basically, in patient X, if a start three pathway is activated, in fashion Y, probably NRF2 pathway is activated, and that need to be blocked to, for the efficient treatment of systemic therapy. So now, in last two slides, what I am trying to show, it is a complete study. What I want to show is whether the stem cell marker can be used as a non-invasive detection strategy. Mainly, my goal is to develop a screening test as a marker of exposure or as a marker for eventually for diagnosis. So what you see here, the, in the, this is adjacent normal and this is tumor. And you see CD24, that is, I am not going to, oh, mechanistically shows that, like how, what CD24 enhance the cancer stem cell, but those that I did not show, just CD24 is a stem cell marker. I mean, I will conclude that way. So in tumor, in primary tumor, it overexpress. Then this is in mRNA in TCGA cohort, we checked in, that is for independent validation, you see it is overexpress. Then we check 24 control and 24 tumor, I mean in the urine. So you see in cancer patient, CD2 24 overexpress. So then basically in this cohort, we tested additional 15 gene based on our previous published data, which are presumably stem cell marker. Then these three combination, because we did not include here COX-2 and SOX-2, the reason is they are less sensitive than these, I mean, sensitivity and specificity. So considering all the sensitivity and specificity, we selected these three gene. And we found really nice, I mean, true positive in this um, cohort. And in the following table, it will be more clear. So, and the most important thing is analytical sensitivity. Because what you are getting in the urine, it's really happening in the primary tumor. So this is the, when you check the expression in primary tumor, as well as in the urine, matched patient, we found it really somewhat consistent. Not very, I mean, dis uh, not much discrepancies here. And in this table, this is, I want to explain. The key point here is, because if whether we are able to detect non-muscle invasive tumor, because if somebody has muscle invasive tumor, he or she will present to the clinic with symptoms. So probably we need not any, I mean, early detection marker. But for non-muscle invasive tumor, patient or population who are in high risk population, like those people who are exposed to arsenic for 10 years, 15 years, will, or those who are a smoker, they definitely are high risk population. So whether we can detect their cancer early. So, and mostly in screening, you will get non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. So here you can see, like in three combination, this is the sensitivity, and most importantly, 
in low grade, as I told before, when I talk about the COX-2 and SOX-2, in low grade here also you are getting more sensitive um, as a sensitive marker, three, three marker combination. And again, in cytology, positive and cytology negative. The issue is, in the clinic, whether you can add something with actually cancer, but the cytologist, by urine cytology, cannot tell you by seeing the morphology. Sometimes in the pathological report, they wrote like atypical cell, but they are not definite whether it is a cancer cell or not cancer cell. Then the patient need to go for cystoscopy, which is invasive and costly, definitely. So then whether we can add something that higher cystoscopy is negative, but adding something we can tell, we can screening, or we can make more selective patient that this particular patient need go for cystoscopy. So that is most important in cytology, negative patient, uh, also we able to see this marker overexpress combination like 81 point, I mean 82% uh, approximately. So the goal is if we have the urine, definitely we will continue this study to see whether this marker, in other words, in general cancer, we need a lot of validation here as well, whether this marker can be used as a marker of exposure as well as marker for early detection of cancer or aid in cytology for more definitive uh, treatment uh, diagnosis. And these are the people who helped me. And basically, these are my external collaborator and this monster clinician. And these two people, my, during the work, they are postdoc, now they are faculty member in our uh, department. And Luigi did most of the bioinformatics works. It's really helpful. And his clinician and Dr. Sidonaski is our divisional director. He was my mentor uh, during my postdoctoral period, and still we are working together. So, and these are the funding agency. So thank you for your time. Great talk, and I, I like how clinically forward your work is. Uh, it's really um, quite helpful. One question I have is that as this goes into phase one, two, and three trials, you're likely to be targeting populations that have never been exposed to these three drugs previously. Have you thought about what phase four is gonna look like, where an older population are likely to come in and have had exposure to COX-2 inhibitors before, have been treated for macular degeneration, have maybe already undergone chemotherapy, and whether the timing of when you start each of these drugs might play a role in how effective the, the three combination would be? Well, the issue is because um, I am not a clinician, but the issue here, what I know that for clinical trial, any clinical trial, those, if they are ineligible for any other modality, then they are go for clinical trial. So, or they have been treated before with a standard regime and they are not responding. So basically, I mean, you, if, if it is, it is definitely better if you get a patient who has not been treated before by anything, then you'll see real effect. But if they are treating, then definitely they are being sensitized with something, some pathway. Then if you treat them, but it's still it is good, probably. I mean. Can you, can you preview that by looking in your mouse models? Oh, I mean. We probably can try. I mean, if we found, because we tested only three FDX model. So if we test probably like 100 FDX model, and some model we may see the conventional therapy is not responding, 
then because in mouse model we can manip manipulate yes then we can grow it again then we can try with our combination I and mean, if it is effective that definitely will be uh, more helpful for to use it in the clinic oh, okay see that that what we found in the patient derived genograph model so why would not treat in the clinic yeah time for one more question Hi, yeah, I just have a question about one of your methods. So um, for the in vivo xenograft model, how long after the xenograft does it take for tumorigenesis to begin, and at what time point did you start the drugs? So whose model you are talking about, FDX model or cell line genograft model? Yeah, the one where you take the tumor cells from the patient. Patient? Yeah. Well, uh, ideally, what we do, we take a small piece of tumor and do it, and when tumor grow till 150 to 200 millimeter, then we start treatment. Okay, does that kind of compare to when a patient would be diagnosed about a tumor that size, or? Uh, well, I mean, it depends, basically, it will vary a lot. Because, I mean, it's like, if it is a very big muscle invasive tumor, no metastasis, but muscle invasive, and if it is a big tumor, then there are now, they have this standard protocol, it is called neoadjuvant therapy. Then they decrease the tumor, and they do the surgery. So it's basically, it's depending on a specific patient. We do have time for another question. Was there one? You already have a microphone? Yeah, Sorry. okay. Yeah. Okay, so I was just wondering if you've seen any other effects of inhibiting SOX2 or if there's um, kind of more of a precedent set previously of using methods to inhibit SOX2 as a way to reduce tumor generation. I mean, you mean any other side effect? Yeah, what else? Yeah, like, what so else basically, basically, I mean, if you block COX2 in our mouse model, we did not, we noticed very carefully, and after the therapy also, we see all other internal organ, and definitely we also measured the, whether there is significant weight loss during the therapy, and we did not notice that. Okay. It is not there, yeah. I had a very small question sure. about your last part with the markers of um, cancer. Are they, could they also be predictive markers? So, because these are markers from when it's already a tumor, but could you um, have them as markers for before the tumor develops so that you could prevent and mo closely monitor and screen for tumor? Yeah, I believe so, because when I show you some data that marker of exposure, like if somebody exposed to arsenic 100 microgram per liter for 10 years, if you collect their urine and you see it is highly expressed, this marker, then you may predict probably that patient has a probability to develop cancer, but I mean it needs large number of sample size with all other epidemiologic study mainly. Yeah. I mean, with long-term follow-up, yes. Yeah, true. That was it. Okay, thank oh, One more question. Yes, there is. Like, well, one last minute. Okay. I'm curious, arsenic in the environment exists as two species, arsenic-3, arsenic-5. And when you talk about it, you just say arsenic. But I think it matters whether it's 3 or 5. Have you looked at the speciation? I, I'll, oh, we use here inorganic arsenic. Yeah, but inorganic arsenic is zero. It's, uh, and well, we use like AOS3 or S2 because I did not, I mean, which is mostly prevalent in the water. For example, it, it, it matters whether it's three or five, and what the availability, so I was curious whether you tried to tease that out. Yeah. I mean, I have definitely, it is, I, I know what I treated it. It is from Sigma, so I, I am able to know, but I think AS2 or 3, something like that or something, I mean, it, it's help. But it is from Sigma, so. And uh, it is written in our paper, basically, with reference. <laughs> it is not in my head now. Okay. Cool. 
Well, let's give a round of applause for Dr. Mohamed Hopes.